welcome everybody in the, uh, the Zoom audience. Um, I'm Terry Magadie, the, the chair of our Elder Law Committee for the Trust and Estates section. And um, you should be getting within 24 hours your, your MCLE certificate for the program today. And the first thing we do before starting the program is we turn matters over to our sponsors because we're, we're very grateful for them. And uh, the first two sponsors you'll hear from personally. Um, Nancy? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we just want to tell you how grateful we are to be a part of this um, elder law section. We wanted you all to know that not only are we probate uh, specialists and certified, but we're also certified in the senior division as well. So we've been working a lot this year, especially with uh, conservatorships. So we're here to help with anything that you need. Be sure to consider us a resource. And have a good meeting. Thanks, Carrie. Welcome, Nancy. Orit. Hi, everyone. I'm Orit Kadish, broker and owner of Geffen Real Estate, a dynamic brokerage specializing in serving the trust and estate community with a team of 25 agents with boots on the ground throughout Southern California. I recently launched my book titled The Practitioner's Handbook for Probate Real Estate. Thank you so much for those of you who have read it and wrote a review. I truly appreciate it. For those of you who have not read it, please take a minute to check it out. It's available on Amazon and the link is in the chat box. Take a few minutes to read the reviews. And if you're interested in reading it and providing a review, please text me and I'll have a complimentary copy shipped to you. Enjoy your program and back to you, Terry. Thanks for read. And now for our, our next sponsors, we're gonna see them on the screen. The first sponsor on the screen is, is Glen Oaks Escrow, Marcine Klein, a great escrow company. Just, just had a transaction with them recently. Uh, they specialize in, in probate, trust, states, all the things that we do in our, in our field. So thank you, Glenn Oaks, for being a sponsor. Next sponsor is the California Title Company. Once again, a, a title company that, that specializes in our area, trust, probates, estates, and um, uh, very helpful to have, have somebody like a title company that really knows our area, that can solve problems for us. So thank you, California Title Company. And finally, um, our sponsor, Manufacturers Bank. Uh, they have a trust and estates banking team that, again, it's very helpful to have someone in, in the banking field that, that knows our industry. Um, and that's uh, Manufacturers Bank. Thank you so much for being our sponsor. And now um, I'm gonna introduce our speaker today, uh, Stu Zimring, uh, known a very long time, you know, long time colleague in, in the uh, elder law field. Uh, Stu is the, the past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, but even much more prestigious than that is that Stu, was our very first speaker when we started the Elder Law Committee. Uh, I forgot how many years ago it was. I don't know, 25. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. It was long long time Stu ago. and I were both about 15 then. And uh, we started very early. <laughs> I can't believe so much time has passed. But Stu has spoken at the very first program. Thank you, Stu. And for quite a few programs since then. And a uh, great guy, great attorney. Um, and I'm going to turn the program over to him. Uh, talk about the SECURE Act, special needs trusts, and all sorts of things uh, related to that. Stu? Thanks, Terry. Uh, let me bring up our screen here. It is, it is always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have the Beverly Hills Bar Association is the bar association to which I have belonged the longest uh, of any of the bar associations around town. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to meet all of you, and I thank you uh, for the invitation. And Terry, I think the measure of how long uh, we've known each other and worked together, your hair was dark and I had hair. So uh, uh, it, it goes back that far. Uh, all right. What I want to talk about today is an, an aspect uh, of the, uh, the SECURE Act that's now been in effect for about a year and a half. Uh, the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act, or SECURE Act, uh, was adopted in 2019 and was signed into law December 20th, effective January 1 of 2020. And for most of the traditional estate planners, the major impact 
of the act was to truncate the length of time in which a uh, beneficiary of an IRA and uh, who inherits an IRA uh, could take to pay out uh, their uh, IRA over a period of time. They no longer had the full life expectancy that the owner of the IRA has. Um, and what we're going to talk about is the one exception to that. And the one exception to that is known as the designated beneficiaries. There are three categories of designated beneficiaries under the act. And these are people who are eligible for the 10-year payout rather than the five-year payout. And within that, we'll be talking about a subset of that. So a designated beneficiary is anyone who is named as the beneficiary of an IRA. An eligible designated beneficiary, an EDB, is a person who is qualifies qualified by virtue of their status or uh, their condition. An eligible designated beneficiary is someone who is uh, allowed to take their required minimum distribution from an inherited IRA using the traditional life expectancy method under the Internal Revenue Code. And for purposes of today, with very few exceptions, I'm not going to be quoting code sections uh, specifically. Now, the three categories that are eligible designated beneficiaries are the surviving spouse of the IRA owner and a person who is disabled uh, or has a disability or is chronically ill. Those people uh, are allowed to continue to take the required minimum distributions as if the SECURE Act didn't exist. Everyone else is either subject to the 10-year rule if they are a designated, a designated beneficiary or they fall into the other category, which is basically charities or trusts, uh, which are not see-through trusts in which a, a designated beneficiary can be uh, identified. So point one, how do we determine eligibility? Eligibility as a eligible designated beneficiary is determined as of the date of death of the IRA owner. So if you have a child who is a beneficiary of the IRA and they become disabled at a later point, they cannot switch over from the 10-year rule to the life expectancy rule. Eligibility as an eligible designated beneficiary is only determined as of the date of death. So now we get, and a lot of this is going to be dealing with definitions, as is so many other things in terms of the Internal Revenue Code and in dealing with special needs trusts uh, in general. An individual is a disabled beneficiary if she is unable to engage in any substantial gainful activity by reason of any medically determinable physical or mental impairment, which can be expected to result in death or to be of long continued and indefinite duration. Now, this is slightly different than the social security definition. The one that those of us who've been working in the special needs trust field uh, have been used to uh, for all of our working careers in that regard. Under the Social Security Administration a definition, an individual is considered to be disabled for purposes of the act if, and I'm now quoting, is unable to engage in any substantial gainful activity by reason of any medically determinable physical or mental impairment, which can be expected to result in death or which has lasted or can be expected to last for a continuous period of not less than 12 months. Note the difference. Under Internal Revenue Code Section 72M7, the requirement is that the disability lasts for an indefinite period. The expectation here under the Internal Revenue Code is that the disability is expected to last for a lifetime. And that's what makes the person eligible for the lifetime payout under the uh, life expectancy rules. Further, the Internal Revenue Code definition 
requires that proof of the disability must be provided. Now, in the social security world, the definition of disability, if there hasn't been a so social security disability claim, is somewhat looser. But in the Internal Revenue Code, there is, and we'll see this a little bit later as to what that is, specific healthcare professionals, health uh, healthcare providers and professionals are the ones who document the, the disability, the nature, and the projected length of that disability. Under And that proof under the Social Security Administration goes to the Social Security Administration. Under the SECURE Act, the proof of disability goes to, we don't know at this point. And as you're going to see, there is a question out there that we haven't seen an answer to in the regs yet, and I've not seen anything in, in my research that says that it goes to the service, that it goes to the custodian of the IRA or the administrator of the pension plan or both. We don't know. This is one of the unresolved questions that are still out there. Okay. Now, in addition, we now have this new definition separate and apart from the social security definition, social, uh, separate and apart from a definition of disability is this chronically ill category. And under the Internal Revenue Act, the definition of chronically ill basically tra tracks the definition of chronically ill for purposes of triggering the tax advantages of receiving benefits under a long-term care insurance policy. So you have the person is unable to perform. And again, I'm basically quoting from the Internal Revenue Code here, but unable to perform without substantial assistance from another individual, at least five, uh, two of the five ADLs of those listed in the Internal Revenue Code, and that they are to last indefinite, uh, indefinitely. So they have to have a disability similar to the definition above, or they require supervision to protect the beneficiary from threats to health and safety due to severe cognitive impairment. This opens up a whole new category for us in terms of the tax advantages of utilizing the life expectancy payout tables. The determination of chronically ill must be certified as such by a licensed healthcare practitioner, and that term uh, is defined in the code. And again, the proof of certification goes to question mark. Uh, we're, we're not sure. In the long-term care insurance payout provisions, notices are sent to the service and what they do with them at this point in time, you know, I, I have uh, no knowledge. Uh, practice point number one. As we who have been drafting special needs trusts have been doing for a long time, we kind of focus on the word disability or disabled. And probably the bulk of our clients or their uh, be the beneficiaries of the trust that we're creating for them do qualify as people with disabilities as that term is defined both in the Social Security Act and now under the SECURE Act. But I think one of the takeaways from today that I hope you, you do have is that we shouldn't just knee jerk to that definition because chronically ill may be more helpful in a lot of situations where the person may not be disabled under the Social Security Act or under the Internal Revenue Code, but is chronically ill under the definition in the Internal Revenue Code and under the SECURE Act. And as a result, as we'll be seeing when we talk about AMBITS in a minute, we may be able to utilize the lifetime payout if it's the right thing to do. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. We may be able to utilize the lifetime payout under the required minimum distributions for someone who would not otherwise necessarily qualify as a person with a disability under the Social Security Act 
and get the stretch out, get the tax benefits of that in a uh, in a special needs trust. So uh, that's just something to be keeping in the back of your mind. And when you're dealing with someone who's possibly very high functioning, may even be able to work in some uh, supervised environment, but is chronically ill or may not be able to work on a full-time basis or even full-time part-time basis because the chronic illness prevents them from doing that, doesn't mean they won't be eligible for an extended payout of their inherited uh, IRA. And I'm using, just so we're clear, I'm using the term IRA generically here to cover any retirement plan uh, that would fall within the uh, uh, SECURE Act. This leads us to our new best friend, AMBITS, Applicable Multi-Beneficiary Trust. What would we do if we didn't have the people in the tax world and the IRS and Congress giving us all these wonderful anagrams uh, every year to, to add to our arsenal of things that we'll, we will use to confuse our clients and that will confuse the heck out of us going forward. But this particular toy, this particular tool is really, really a good thing because it solves a problem we've had under the traditional rules. So an applicable multi-beneficiary trust is a trust that has more than one beneficiary, all of whom are treated as designated beneficiaries, i.e. they've been named in the IRA as beneficiaries, or the trust has been named as the beneficiary, and it qualifies as a see-through trust because they are all named beneficiaries. And at least one of them is an eligible designated beneficiary. So how's this going to work? First of all, the AMBIT rules supersede the normal rule regarding determination of the applicable dis distribution period uh, when a single trust divides into separate subtrusts. Previously, as you will recall, where you had an IRA pay out to a trust that had multiple beneficiaries, all of whom were, as I like to say, carbon-based life forms, living individuals, the measuring life for determining the RMD and the payout was the age of the oldest person. Now, under AMBIT, where separate trusts are created, they are treated as separate accounts, regardless of the designation of form used to divide them. And as long as the share of the eligible designated beneficiary goes to an SNT of which the eligible designated beneficiary is the sole lifetime beneficiary, not the sole beneficiary, then that SNT gets the life expectancy payout treatment, even though the EDB uh, is not the sole beneficiary. Let, let's walk through that a little more slowly. Mom's IRA has as its beneficiary her living trust, which provides that on her death, the shares of her four children are to go to them outright, except for the one child who is chronically ill. And that share goes to a special needs trust. The IRA custodian, and I'm projecting here as to what the rules will be, the IRA custodian is going to distribute the IRA in four shares. And the three healthy children can take their share and they can have an inherited IRA, but it is going to be subject to the 10-year payout rule. They're going to have to take their interests within a 10-year period. And you know, 
planning note here, which I, I think most everybody knows about at this point, is there is absolutely no requirement that they take it out over the 10 years. They can leave it there to grow and take it out at the 11th month of the ninth year or the 11th month of the 10th year, I guess. Uh, but there's no requirement that they take it out in regular increments. They can, but they don't have to. The share for the chronically ill child is going to be distributed to an inherited IRA held in that child's special needs trust. And that trust provides that on the EDB's death, anything remaining in that child's inherited IRA gets distributed to the three other siblings. Before the SECURE Act, the requirement was that, again, in determining the age by which the RMDs would be calculated had to be the oldest beneficiary, whether it's current or remainder. Under AMBIT, under the SECURE Act, the measuring life determining the RMDs is now the current beneficiary who has the chronic illness. And I think this is truly, truly uh, a, a sea change uh, as to what, we're, uh, what we've had to deal with in the past uh, and what we're going to be able to deal with in the future. All right, uh, I'm gonna move on now uh, quickly into some of the quick refresher for those of you who may not be a uh, special needs trust, or, uh, and this is going to be a, basically a quick refresher uh, as to you know all of the programs that are out there uh, and how they're going to impact uh, what we're going to be doing here. You know, we've got all our traditional programs, Medicaid, SSI, CalFresh, VA with its new rules uh, as far as eligibility uh, in many cases, which are now running almost parallel uh, with the Medicaid qualification and SSI rules, but not quite the same. Uh, the VA, uh, the HUD rules, I want to spend a minute on this just as an aside. Uh, those of you who have been dealing uh, in any of the, uh, with, with any HUD housing issues and the eligibility and, and whether or not a special needs trust is counted as an asset, whether an inheritance is counted as an asset, uh, it is still an extremely murky uh, and counterintuitive and, frankly, my opinion, discriminatory arena in terms of penalizing special needs trust and the beneficiaries of special needs trust. But what I want to say here is I've had the privilege of working with a working group back at HUD in Washington, D.C. on bringing these rules into the 21st century. And I'm hopeful that sometime, I'll say during my lifetime, uh, that we will see uh, a rational approach uh, to how special needs trust and distributions from special needs trust are, are uh, treated uh, going forward. Moving into the world of special needs trusts and how they uh, nest uh, with ambits and with inherited IRAs. Uh, I just want to review that this is going to apply primarily to third-party trusts. If you think about it, uh, that's just common sense. A first-party special needs trust can't or shouldn't be, I'll put it this way, the beneficiary of an inherited IRA. That's third party money. So when you're thinking this through, and I run into this with clients frequently, uh, there is a, a question of, well, you know, Jane has the special needs trust that was created for when she got that uh, PI settlement or that med mal set settlement uh, some time ago. Uh, wouldn't it just be simpler for us to name that trust as the beneficiary of her IRA. It might be, uh, but the problem there is going to be that you're going to subject that, subject that to a state recovery at the back end. 
and the other family members uh, who would otherwise inherit on the death of Jane, if there was anything left, aren't going to get anything. So clearly the, the uh, proper planning approach here is going to be using a third party trust. Now, whether that third party trust is a standalone trust that you create for your client or whether it becomes a sub account of a pooled special needs trust is really up to you. And I think is, is definitely uh, something to consider when you look at the size of the IRA that's gonna be involved. If you've got a relatively small IRA, uh, and I'm not sure how to define that, but in, in the world in which I and most of the colleagues I, probably who are here today, you know, would you consider creating a standalone trust uh, given the cost of creating it, the cost of administering on an ongoing basis of uh, tax filings, et cetera, would you really want to be creating that if you had less than very high five figures and probably uh, more prudently into six figures coming into it as the corpus? And obviously, if, it's, if there's going to be a receptacle to uh, receive an, an inheritance from uh, the deceased IRA owner, in addition to the IRA, then it just makes all the sense in the world that they all flow uh, in, into, the same, uh, into the same pot. So clearly it's a third party trust, but I'm seeing now in, in some of the uh, pool special needs trusts that I'm working with that it's, uh, we're seeing uh, the pool special needs trust sub account being named as the beneficiary uh, of, the, of the IRA interest uh, coming forward. And that's easy to do. You can set up uh, if that's what you wanna do rather than creating a, a separate third party trust, you create, open up, uh, a, a sub account with a pooled, stress, pooled special needs trust. You put a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks in it as a placeholder, and it's there, uh, ready to receive uh, the inherited IRA down downstream. Uh, this, you know, we we've all been through this before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I am making an assumption here, uh, which is always a very dangerous thing to make, that. Uh, those of us who are attending today are familiar with these rules. If there are other members uh, who are attending today who have any questions about some of the basics of first party trusts and, and third party trusts going forward, I am more than happy. Put your question up there in the chat box. I keep looking down there and I'm not uh, seeing it, uh, anybody popping up yet, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to engage in conversation. Uh, the Third party trusts and the SECURE Act, uh, as we've talked about, first of all, you know, they're not subject to the usual rules, but you've got to make sure moving forward that your definitions, especially of disability versus chronically ill uh, and, and how you're going to treat that uh, are consistent now, not only with the SSI rules or with the Medicaid rules, but also with the Internal Revenue Code. The counterintuitive part that I, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, and then we can throw it open and, uh, to conversation, and I really do enjoy the conversation part of any of these uh, webinars, is really consider, and this is where I totally part company with my colleagues in the traditional estate planning field. You need to carefully consider whether the stretch out is worth it. It's nice to know that you have the ability to do it, but almost by definition, special needs trusts are not focused on what I would call the long game. We're not talking about multi-generational estate planning here. What we're really talking about in the special needs trust world are quality of life issues and creating quality of life benefits for our beneficiary whose horizon line in terms of ability to enjoy a quality of life, whose life expectancy may be far different from what the actuarial tables tell us about an individual of a certain age, of a certain gender. And I think 
uh, that one of the questions we need to ask, especially when a client comes to us, and I think especially in the higher net worth world, when the client comes to us, having been had drilled into her that stretching out the IRA, multi-generational planning, getting that IRA corpus down as many generations as you can, uh, you know, for as long as possible is, you know, that's the gold standard. First of all, if they haven't already been disabused of what the real world is today, they have to be counseled on the fact that, hey, unless you've got an eligible designated beneficiary here, those kids who don't have disabilities or who aren't chronically ill, they're going to have 10 years. So, you know, don't think about multi-generational planning here. And the benefit of having the life expectancy, lifetime payout for the eligible designated beneficiary may look great on paper, but the reality may be that you're going to want to spend it much faster than that required annual minimum distribution. So if you're not already doing it, you know, clearly I think you want to be talking to your clients about what is the true life expectancy of this beneficiary? It, it's a, it's one of those really hard questions to ask. And it's also, I think one of those really hard questions to get anything approaching a usable answer. Because so many times the healthcare providers, A, don't want to talk about it. And B, even if they're willing to talk about it, the answer, the honest answer is, we don't have a clue. We just don't know. And so, you know, you, you may at that point, rather than dealing with the healthcare professionals, the doctors, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, uh, you may want to shift your conversation over to some of the life care planners and some of the people who do the projections on uh, you know, life care needs in, in, a, in a litigation context and bring one of them into the picture to give you the timeline that Jane is going to, you know, Jane is 18, Jane is 11 years old. She suffers from whatever this condition is. It is projected that she's going to need surgery to uh, correct this as she begins to grow, have a growth spurt at age 12, 13, 14. And the projected cost in today's dollars of that is X. And if she survives that on and on and on, uh, and that's going to give you a more real, I think, expectation of how you should plan to do your uh, uh, distributions over a period of time. Um, so I think that they become a valuable member of the team. Uh, and if you've done any work in the litigation field with, with litigation special needs trusts, then you know who these people are and you know uh, how, they're, how they work and, and the kind of really quality product they can give you with all kinds of really good projections. So that's something to think about. Okay, so I want to shift gears just a little bit here and look at some of the other uh, options. What are we telling our clients to do where they have a family member who's an eligible designated beneficiary? If you're plan participant has a disability, then you need to be thinking forward and acting in a proactive manner, in my opinion. So I would be talking to that client who has a disability and may be losing the capacity downstream to deal with a EDB or someone who might become an EDB prior to the plan participant's death. So I'm thinking now we want to put into our durable powers of attorney for asset management, the ability to change beneficiaries on the plans so that if someone becomes an eligible designated beneficiary, we've got the authority to change the, uh, change the designated beneficiary designation to a special needs trust for that individual. If you've got a 
disabled plan participant who's under a conservatorship. Think about bringing a 2580 petition to change the beneficiary designations and create the, the SNT for uh, the benefit of the eligible designated beneficiary. Or if you've got a married couple, a similar proceeding under probate code section 3604 or SEC to affect the same kinds of changes. Don't let the fact that your, that your client or one of your clients may suffer from a disability um, take away the, your ability to do that. And the other thing to think about, especially in, in the married couple situation, is think about the fact that in order to do planning for a spouse with a disability, we're back into the world of testamentary trusts. So if you've got a spouse with a disability and a child with a disability, here you have the opportunity for a really long stretch out if you want to do it. You leave, you name the spouse as the primary IRA beneficiary. He receives automatic treatment for lifetime payout. And you could direct that to a testamentary special needs trust for that spouse's benefit. And that trust on the spouse's death flows the EDB, the child with a disability, into a special needs trust if there's anything left in the, that IRA. And you, in effect, manage to get the, uh, a two-generation payout there, which I think would be a great advantage. So uh, as I said at the beginning, we, we still have some unanswered questions. We don't know to whom we are going to be reporting. I think clearly when you have a, uh, an EDB other than the spouse, you're absolutely going to give, need to give proof to the IRA custodian or the plan administrator to justify your demand that they continue to treat that on the life expectancy tables rather than subject to the 10-year rules. Whether the service is going to want to have a file on these um, unknown. I think in, uh, certainly in the chronically ill uh, situation, They've already got a mechanism in place that they've been using for the proof of eligibility under the long-term care insurance situations to receive that. But especially given they're understaffed, they're overworked, there's uh, talk in Congress about increasing uh, their budget so they can hire more people. You know, if we think about it, special needs trust for those of us who do this elder law, for all of us who, who are working in that field, this is a big thing. But when you step back, go up to the 10,000, 15,000 foot level and look at, at a bigger picture as to what the service deals with, what the Social Security uh, Administration deals with, we're not the big fish in the small pond. We're a small fish in a much bigger pond. And I always find it fascinating when I'm talking to the folks at Social Security uh, how, yes, uh, they're spending a lot of time and energy on, on our stuff. And, and it's good to see, especially since things have gotten a little bit easier with Social Security Administration. But uh, we're just one piece of a much larger uh, a jigsaw puzzle in, in their world. And the same thing's going to be true now, I'm sure, with the Internal Revenue Service. And frankly, I think their learning curve uh, it could be painful for them uh, and for us, possibly uh, moving forward. Um, so, talked about this. Um, with that, uh, I've got no more wisdom to impart today. Oh, with one more thing. There are, in, in the materials that uh, you'll, you've got access to, the paper I wrote uh, that was the genesis of today's presentation in connection with the CEB UCLA conference last uh, earlier this year, um, you'll see a, a number of references to some very, very good papers uh, that have been written uh, since the SECURE Act came into effect as it applies to what we've been talking about today. And always, if you do not have 
a copy of Natalie Choate's uh, Planning for Retirement uh, book uh, in its most recent edition. And if that book isn't very, very uh, used and, and thumbed through, uh, then you got to get it. Uh, it is the, the Bible in this world. Uh, it, it, she lays it all out. She does a marvelous job of it. And it's uh, supplemented by her newsletter, which you can sign up for free online uh, at her website. Uh, she absolutely has all the latest information on everything involving the SECURE Act. And God bless Natalie. She does pay, pay particular attention uh, to the world of special needs trust. It's, it's uh, an area uh, of which she is very fond. And uh, those of us in that arena are, are very, very thankful. Uh, finally, a pitch um, on special needs trust. The annual Stetson Special Needs Trust Conference uh, is going to be in person in addition to being live streamed uh, in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida this October. I think it starts October 15th. So those of you uh, who have been going, who missed it last year or attended uh, uh, online, uh, we're going to be live again, and it would be great to see all of you there. With that, I'm going to exit from uh, sharing, and I'm happy to discuss any questions, any subject at all involving this world or anything else, for that matter, uh, involving uh, special needs trusts. And I want to thank all of you for your time and attention. Terry, it's back to you. And I don't. There I am up there. Um, and again, I'll. I'll um give priority. I don't see any other, any questions here, but I'll, let me, I'll, I'll throw out a couple things for discussion. It's interesting, uh, Stu, you mentioned, is this worthwhile? Is the stretch worthwhile? And I'll, I'll get any comment you have uh, from a discussion I heard from, uh, there were financial planners, investment people, which tend to, you know, they tend to see things from their perspective. And they were talking about, they were doing planning for someone with a disability and they were talking about why don't we put that per, the disabled person's share over there in the iris so you could take advantage of this and have other people share elsewhere. So my initial reaction, we did, this was just, I think I was not personally involved in this very much, but was oh my, you're, you're, you're making a choice to put the disabled person's assets in a vehicle that has other disadvantages just because you're thinking everything is about stretching. You get, do you want to, it sounds like you, you have, you've thought about that thinking from the financial world. Any comment on that? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I think about it all the time because from my standpoint, it, I mean, and I, you know, I want to say some of my best friends are financial planners, right. uh, but, but the fact of the matter is you're absolutely correct. You know, and, and this gets back to, and I think they're going to have to start thinking a little bit differently now that we're for a lot of their clients in a 10 year stretch out max. But the, 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 the lodestar, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow of, you know, being able to grow these funds and growth was, was the, the, the core term uh, to grow and grow and grow in a tax deferred. And they didn't like to use that word deferred, but I'll use it. Tax deferred basis. It has a lot of advantages unless you need the money. Mm. And, and what I, I, tell the financial planners and, and where it really gets into, and I'll kind of try and put the two together with the quality of life and the projected need, you know, I'll meet a financial planner halfway by saying, okay, I'm looking at the life care plan we have for Jane that says she's going to need major reconstructive surgery in eight years. Let's do this. We've got an inheritance potentially coming from mom and dad, and they're going to leave into her special needs trust. And we name the IRA as uh, we name the beneficiary, the special needs trust as the beneficiary of the IRA. And what we tell the trustee of the special needs trust is as a suggestion, because we can't tell them what to do, is you got two sets of assets here. You got the brokerage account that's got the Microsoft and the Apple and all that good stuff there. And it's churning out some, some gain and some dividends. And you got the IRA that's growing tax deferred. Target that for a distribution, big dis take your minimums. 
You got to do that. Take the minimums, but look to that one to be the funding source for the surgery in 10 years or in eight years, rather than having to sell off the Apple stock, which is now worth $100,000 a share uh, and, and balance the two. But it, it is an educational process. And sometimes I, I will say, you know, I fail the class because I, I, I don't educate uh, or, it, you know, I, I talk, they don't listen, that quality of life is more important. Now, I will say those people in the financial world uh, who specialize in dealing with special needs trust, they get it or they say they get it, but you're right. Their, their whole focus is on growth and that's perfectly appropriate for what they do 90% of the time. And we all are out here as the outliers dealing with the 10%. We do. I see that. We have a very, we have a detailed question, which if you could see that. You yeah, can... I just brought it up. Despite oh. the new tenure rule, the participant is already in pay status. Then a dis... Uh, Designated beneficiary can continue to take out over the principal remaining life expectancy. Correct. Um, no, I don't. Okay, I don't think so. If if it's a designated beneficiary, um, and I'm happy to be, I'm truly happy to be corrected on this one. But my understanding that is whether whether the participant is in pay status or not on the participant's death any beneficiary who is not a eligible designated beneficiary has to take it in 10 years now i know under old law current law that if the edb is the spouse that their payout is recalculated to, to their to their life expectancy. And I'm pretty sure the law says that if you've got an EDB, it's recalculated to their life expectancy and everybody else has to take out over 10 years. Uh, I'm, I think I'm right, but uh, you know I, my, my answer to that was as soon as we're off this uh, or as soon as I can, I'm, I'm going to go back and hit Natalie Choate and, and find out if I'm right. Um, but I, I think I'm right. And Stu, in the meantime, we have another question. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Remind us, I see it. And fortunately, Gary prefaced it with a cynical question. It reminds me of like when we had, when Medi-Cal was stronger in the recovery area and you had, I've had it, like nine beneficiaries and one disinherited, estranged, disabled beneficiary who's really not taken care of. He saves recovery for everybody. But this is, this is on your, your area now. Okay. With, uh, and, and, and Gary and Gary Edelstone is one of the brightest guys I know. And every time yep. I see his name with a question, I, I start to quake in my boots. <laughs> um, okay. Suppose the client has a very large IRA account and his primary beneficiaries are competent adults. Could a planner name a disabled beneficiary with a limit with limited special needs trust distributions and get mm -hmm. a long-term deferral of the payouts that will primarily benefit the remainder beneficiary? Uh, Primary the, the the remainder primary beneficiary or beneficiaries. Okay, under the new rules, I I think your answer is, is yes if I'm understanding the question correctly. So what I'm hearing you say is, mom names EDB's special needs trust as the sole beneficiary of the IRA and the remainder beneficiaries of the special needs trust are the healthy children. And as you say, somewhat cynically, uh, Terry, she does that betting that the life expectancy of the eligible designated beneficiary is relatively short. And therefore, there will still be a significant chunk left to the remainder beneficiaries. Under the new rules, the answer to that is that will work. 
because the measuring life and calculating the life expectancy under that scenario is the EDB, not the remainder beneficiary. So the answer to that question is yes, but, but when distributed out from the special needs trust, they're all going to be subject to the 10 year rule. So yeah, you've achieved, you, you have achieved something at that point. You may have achieved something really good because again, the remainder beneficiaries can let it continue to grow for, for, for 10 years uh, and don't have to take it out at all. Good, good. And out. good. Great question. I like that one. Oh, here we got another one. Susan, you have another one at the end. Number three. Yes. The answer, Susan, the, uh, on the death of the EDB, the 10 year rule for the healthy beneficiaries runs from the EDB's death. That is correct. Yes. Okay. If we have any other, Oh, we got, look now they're, it looks like there was a fourth one. Oh, there's another. Oh, thank oh, you. Just a thing. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You, Susan. Let's see, we have a little, we have a few minutes. Um, yep. You know, I could throw out a, the, an issue you touched on. Um, you're on this this uh, working committee with HUD. Oh, and, I knew that's know, what you were getting. Affordable say. housing in Section 8, that's always been like a, it's, I'll say it's like a challenge to all of us working in this field. Uh, I'll try to tie it into your program. Do you? No, no, I, I'm happy to go into it because uh, is there, is there anything that you see that you've been in contact with that you could see could provide further planning. Is the Secure Act entered to this in any way, or it's really those are two separate things? Well, I no, I ask question to tie them in together. Stuart, uh, the okay. floor is yours. You got all right. Got, so I think the way I, I think the way it ties in from a HUD standpoint, and, and first of all, um, we're it's not on a regular, regular basis, but uh, I, I am in touch. I, I am a point person of contact for HUD uh, and, a, and two working groups there, I think it is now, who are working to understand what the health special needs trusts are. I mean, it, it was a the couple of meetings I've had with them uh, have, have just been fascinating in terms of, you know, what all of us do, meat and potatoes every morning was visionary from their standpoint. They'd never heard of anything so wonderful. Um, for those of you who don't know, the, the short course here is that the HUD rules as they currently provide, but are in the process of modification, which could take another couple of years. An inheritance or a PI settlement, med mal, a judgment, a one-time windfall does not count as income, countable income, or as an asset in determining HUD eligibility for subsidized rent under HUD. Unless you put it into a special needs trust. In which case, any distribution of principal, and it's really important to understand what I just said, we're all, we are only talking about distributions of principal and whether they are now counted as income or whether they don't count. I am now going to quote from the HUD Green Book. If Sally, and I'm always do this verbatim, if Sally Inherit, if Sally gets a personal injury judgment for having been in an automobile accident of $50,000 and sticks the cash under her mattress and uses the money to pay for things, that those distributions do not count as income to her in determining her share of rent. If Sally puts that money into a special needs trust, every distribution from principal will be counted as income. No one has ever been able to explain why this makes any sense at all, except as I learned when I started working with HUD, is that they don't understand trust, period, beginning and end of conversation. Now, there is case law out there. Uh, I'm totally blanking on the name of the case, but it involved the Santa Monica uh, Housing Authority um, that says, no, that's, that's not right. They don't count. And, and that is the law in Los Angeles County. 
sustained on appeal. Uh, and, and that's the law in, in, in L.A. County. Uh, there are two cases back east that have gone in different directions. And it is that and they're at the federal level that the L.A. case was uh, Superior Court um, and Court of Appeals. But um, HUD is working in its usual slower than molasses in a, in a uh, freeze to get it corrected. But at least now I know that the people who are in charge of beginning to change the rules understand what the issues are. Key to understanding how HUD works to begin with is that assets don't count. You can, uh, it's only income. So if you, you could own a hundred acres of land out in Palmdale that has a fair market value of half a million dollars, but is not being worked, isn't generating any income, it's going to have absolutely no effect uh, on your eligibility for subsidized housing. Uh, it is only your income uh, that counts in that decision, which is why it is so critical that they understand that having an asset, having principal, an asset that's worth my hypo, in the hypothetical $50,000 shouldn't be counted against you. The other thing that affects the impact of IRAs is that the test for HUD is, is someone as to whether or not it's counted as income is, is someone receiving regular distributions of funds. I have successfully made the Arctic argument in HUD eligibility matters that if the special needs trust are getting past the asset issue as to whether or not it's an asset, if the trust is making distributions in differing amounts in random time periods, those distributions are not countable as income, whether they're income or principal, because they are not regular. Therefore, but if it were an IRA that's making required minimum distributions and they're happening every year, I know for a fact that at least some of the housing authorities around the country can uh, treat those as quote, regular distributions. So a trap here, that you got to be careful about is that if you're special, if you got someone who's in, in, in subsidized housing and you've got a special needs trust that is paying their cell phone bill on a regular monthly basis, theoretically, HUD could challenge that as a regular distribution and include that. I have not lost that battle yet. And where I thought it was ultimately going to be a problem, I've worked around it uh, by saying, okay, the trust isn't going to pay your cell phone bill every anymore two, three times a year, surprise, there'll be a check in the mail. And guess what? That covered four or five months of your cell phone bill and you're reimbursed and you're paying for that out of your SSI. So there are workarounds and I'd be happy to discuss that uh, offline with anybody privately in the back corner of a room someplace where nobody's listening. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Thank you. I think we are, we are one thirty. Thank oh, right. you for the great program. And that's, I think that HUD discussion is called a, that's a bonus, right? <laughs> that's my pleasure. <laughs> Actually, for people who are interested, the, the, uh, really? in the Stetson, in the Stetson uh, Special Needs Trust Conference papers, probably going back six, seven, eight years. Uh, if you go onto the Stetson website, uh, you can download those papers. There are three or four really good papers. Uh, one of them from my primary contact at HUD, uh, who's, got, who's the one who got me all involved in this from the HUD perspective on uh, on the whole thing. And the unfortunate thing is things haven't changed a lot. They've changed a little, but those papers are still a, a pretty good uh, description of, of what the current HUD world is. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Terry, thank you for the invitation. Bye. It's always such a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Just great to see you. Bye, everyone. Take uh, care. Have a good week.